Hi there, I'm Randy Gilbert and want to thank you for joining us on this edition of Capital Update. Today, as always, we have 33's uh, Senator David Osmick. Hi, Randy. Thanks for having me. David, thanks for being here. We have 33B's representative, Cindy Pugh. Welcome, Cindy. Hi, Randy. Thanks. Great to be here. Well, glad thank to you. have you here. Thank you. And uh, 33A's representative, Jerry Hurtas. Jerry, welcome. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. So we're going to have an interesting show today. We have a lot of things to talk about, um, but I thought we'd start off and, and really talk about what really didn't happen or, or explain to people what happened in the session, the, your normal session this year. You know, we went to session, and uh, boy, in the last 15, 20 minutes, all heck broke loose, and it seemed like a lot of work didn't get done, but I think it's important to let the people know what did get done and how we got there. So I'm actually going to turn to you, Representative Pugh, okay. and, and say, why don't you give us a little update about, you know, from your perspective, what happened and what passed and what you're happy about that we did get done. Well, sure, thanks. Um, I think I'll start with the fact that it was, I, I believe, the shortest session in what I heard uh, 70 years. So we were working fast and furiously right from the beginning, right up until the end. And although there were things, as you referenced, that didn't get done, um, there were things that did get done. And uh, the, the one thing that I'd like to begin with is the supplemental spending bill. And it was uh, several hundred million dollars. It was a broadly um, bipartisan bill. And the highlight in that particular um, bill to me was the Veterans Pension um, Relief, permanent tax relief for veterans. Uh, Minnesota was one of only a handful of states up until this bill passed and was signed into law that did not afford veterans who have retired um, from military um, to uh, deduct their, to have tax exemption on their benefits. Yeah, so that was as, just huge. As I recall too, the Star Tribune put an article out that said that was not a good bill, so that we actually... Right. Well, yeah. they, were, they were very remiss and on the wrong side of that argument. Uh, Minnesotans uh, greatly appreciate those who have served in the military, as do we. And I I'm just so delighted that that passed. Nice. I, I do want to make a comment for the viewers. Normally, the session is about 20 weeks long, and this mm -hmm. session was 10 weeks, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. So just so they understand that time frame and the you know, truncated time frame that we were on. Everything was condensed. Um, the bill introduction uh, window, the uh, deadlines, and we were just working full tilt, uh, really right from the very beginning. Okay. Representative Hurtas? Well, thank you. And, and as uh, Representative Pugh had mentioned, I mean, out of that 10 weeks, you know, committee deadlines were and, and hearing bills through committee, we still heard well uh, over a thousand bills in this. Uh, <laughs> a thousand bills. Yeah, during this period of time. And uh, committee deadlines uh, having finally been met, that really compresses uh, the, the final putting together and assembly of the bills in uh, hearings on it, um, you know, just uh, the last few weeks of the session. Part of the dynamics are always a challenge when you have divided government, which forces compromises. It was agreeing with Senate leadership, Democrat Senate leadership and Republican House leadership on what should be in the bill and what shouldn't be in the bill. And uh, it's often said that deadlines uh, make things happen. If it weren't for the last minute, nothing would get done. And so um, we have a uh, Senate leader that has demonstrated over the last four years he likes to do a time management thing and kind of hold off and not make commitments and really kind of drag out the process right up until the last minute trying to use the clock as leverage to get things that they wanted. And, um, and for our viewers, let's, who, who is the Senate leader? That's Senate Leader Bach, Tom okay. Bach, yeah. So, that, you know, that's kind of why things uh, oftentimes get compressed into the last few days of session. And uh, that is to get leadership to agree on what is in and what's out and uh, what the package of the bill is going to look like. But with regard to the supplemental spending, you know, there, besides the veterans things, there was also a provision called Sophia's Law, which I had uh, chief authored in the House, that did become law, was attached to the supp supplemental bill. And this law was uh, with the horrific incident that happened with the young uh, medical family. Uh, both husband and wife were doctors. They were aboard a boat in Lake Minnetonka and uh, all of the people on board suffered from carbon monoxide poisoning, but unfortunately their daughter Sophia uh, did not recover from the poisoning. And uh, with that, there was uh, effort and movement to 
ask ourselves, you know, should some of these enclosed cabins have uh, carbon monoxide detectors on it to give people warning? Because CO is an odorless uh, gas that you cannot smell and you don't know what's happening to you until suddenly you start getting headaches. And obviously small children have low body mass. They're, the more CO is much more toxic and, yeah. and uh, mm. you know, very much a threat to small children as it is to an adult. Well, thank you for authoring that. I'm glad that that is one thing that did come through that and the veterans benefits and there's a host of other things that happen. Absolutely. So from my vantage point, you know, as we were winding up these 10 weeks, it seemed the leadership of you know, the House was working with the minority of the House and you guys were bringing a lot of things in in bipartisan fashion and had bills that got presented ultimately to the Senate side for, for completion. And we'll get to you in a second here, Senator. Is that the way it actually was occurring from, from the representative's point of view? It absolutely was. And this, um, this supplemental spending bill was referred to as the omnibus omnibus because the um, individual committees did their work as always, but they were all lumped into one large omnibus bill, this um, you know, supplemental spending bill. So higher education, for example, a committee on which I serve, was a part of that, um, that bill, as were you know, state government finance and you know, all of the committees. Um, so yes, it was, you know, it was supplemental. I mean, government, um, a lot of our uh, viewers probably are unclear about the fact that government is fully funded. And we were, as a result of the last year's work, last session, government is fully funded through June of 2017. So we did not need to spend any more, you know, we did not need to do anything in order to keep government fully functional. Okay. And from a House perspective, I guess I would add that uh, we had two major bills that stalled out in the 2015 session. That was the tax bill and the transportation bill. Both of those items were held up, uh, particularly over the issue of uh, raising more revenue, more taxes, the gasoline tax. And uh, Senate leadership there again said, uh, if there's no gas tax, there's going to be no transportation bill, there won't be a tax bill. So those things uh, were really left in committee in 2015 and carried forward uh, into uh, 2016. In the end, we all worked together, at least in the House, and it was such a broad bipartisan bill. Mm -hmm. uh, the tax bill passed, uh, I believe the, the vote total was 123 to 10. I mean, that's the most bipartisan tax bill that we've had in more than 30 years. The bonding bill was also broadly bipartisan. There too, we need two-thirds vote, but it was 91-39. Um, you know, these were two pieces of work that uh, really culminated in the last week of the session where everybody agreed there were major uh, provisions in the tax bill. Some of them got pared down a little bit to you know, make it uh, amenable to both sides. Uh, one of the provisions, again, that I had chief authored was uh, property tax relief uh, regarding the state general levy. And last year's bill, that was uh, to provide an exemption of $500,000 off of the bottom. And that got uh, its very scalable exemption. It got scaled down to 100,000, so it was only 20% of what was introduced last year. But nonetheless, would have made a big difference to uh, job creation and, sure. and uh, trimming some of the costs of doing business in Minnesota. So you had all this bipartisan workmanship going on in the House, mm -hmm. and you sent your bill bills over to the Senate, and that's where all the theatrics happened. Well, that's where it all started. Uh, well, first off, we had a very busy session, um, not only doing bills that, uh, uh, we, that we presented. Um, I had actually two different bills that wound up being wound into omnibus bills. One of them was uh, your da uh, being able to bequeath data private or your data to your, if you die, that you can bequeath your data, whether you're storing it in a, you know, an offsite location, that you can actually have it in your will or have it in an electronic uh, system where you can go online and register it to say if I die here's the person who gets this information um, that actually made it into law so did an amendment to some sta some statutory language for townships so that townships can actually capture fees and, and use those for proactive uh, policing 
uh, which right now... And did they pass? Both these bills They did passed. pass. They were inside Part of, of the omnibus. omnibus bill that Cindy was referencing then? Right. So okay. there were some good things that happened, uh, and there were a lot of constituent service issues uh, dealing with Minsure. People weren't getting access. Minsure still is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we deal with a lot of that a lot, that um, people can't make deadlines because they, the system doesn't work. They can't get... So they call us, and we help intervene with them, as well as other constituent service. So it was, it was very, to put it all together, it was a very busy session. Sure. Um, but um, the, the, big, the biggest change for me in this session was that we met for the first time in, since 1905, we met in the state of the Senate office building. Um, so it was a little bit different scenario, a little bit, it was a lot louder. <laughs> Strangely enough, a smaller room is actually a lot louder. Uh, but we, uh, we did uh, complete the session. Unfortunately, uh, some things did get left at the scrap heap, uh, so to speak. Uh, the tax bill and the bonding bill, especially the bonding bill, is something that we should really need to talk about here, uh, and is, is what happened with the Senate on that bill. Right, and I think the people would like to know most about that because everyone heard in you know the last 15 minutes things went, you know, we're in the Senate chamber, and all of a sudden nothing passed in the last minute of, of session and. We waited there immediately. So right. what happened that everything that the House worked on didn't get passed in the Senate? Well, and the, and with, with the bonding bill, which is the big one, as far as I was concerned, Highway 12 safety money was a priority for me the entire session as it was for Representative Hurtas. Uh, we had it in every bonding bill that came through. When, when, at any time a bonding bill was presented, it was in there. So uh, we were watching the House as they passed their bill, and we actually got the, the copy sent over to us so we could read through as they were finishing the debate of the bonding bill. And we had about 15 minutes. Well, when it came over, suddenly on our desk was a piece of paper with a strike across the number 10 and insert a number 20. It's not an amendment. It's not been registered with the front desk. It's the strangest thing you've ever seen. What, they're try what was attempted to do was to fund Southwest Light Rail by increasing the amount that the rail authority uh, that has the authority to bond for. And if you, if you look at the last four years, and we've all been there for four years, I was on the Transportation Committee of the Senate. We've never heard one comment, one discussion, one bill on Southwest Light Rail. So in the last 15 minutes, and led by Senator Bonoff, she, if you look at the tape, you'll see her going back and forth in the back of the room. They made up a fictitious amendment saying that this was, quote, supposed to be in the bill, and it was missed, although nobody in the House GOP or DFL said that that was ever supposed to be in the bill. It was never part of the agreement. The whole thing, the whole bill collapsed. And the funny part is, well, sad part is, when that bill came across before it was amended, I was one of 16 out of 28, more than half of the Republicans. This bonding bill was going to be the most bipartisan bonding bill in decades. And it was agreed upon by the, by the House. They passed it. We were ready to go. But then they threw on this amendment that was never agreed to, and th and I think the DFL thought they were the DFL Senate thought that they were going to be smart and kick it over to the House, and it didn't work that way. So, uh, unfortunately, so just, I mean, it, it just didn't work. You've dropped a lot of information on, but what I'm hearing you say is that a last-minute change that dealt with light rail mm -hmm. derailed all the work that happened during the ten yes. weeks. It did, and the other thing to think about here too is in the sp the last special session that we did. The Senate DFL reneged on the deal, again, another deal, again. They have a history of not, prom not going through and fulfilling their promises. What they did, again, was in the last 15 minutes, renege on the deal that Senator Bach and, Cur and, she and, and Speaker Doubt had made, which was a, an excellent bipartisan bill, which included that, 12, that, that Highway 12 safety money. Fortunately, we've been able to get some of that movement outside of the legislature. But you know, you have Senator Bonoff running around in the back of the room, bringing up an amendment that is actually a it's a phantom that okay. nobody's ever talked about. So they were trying to send that back to the House then right. in the final 15 minutes, and even if it would have gotten to the House, it probably wouldn't have made it by the legal end of session no. midnight. No. So there was gamemanship happening here, mm -hmm. and the House had adjourned then some 15 minutes or eight minutes before midnight, and it died on the floor in the Senate then because. Did it go to vote? Well, they brought it back because it was halfway, literally the bill was halfway across the street before they realized that the, the adjournment had taken place. So it came back. Senator Benson made the motion to try and unravel the, the, the amendment and, and take it off of the bill so we could pass the bill before midnight. And suddenly the front desk and Senator, the, chief, the president of the Senate didn't realize the motions that had to be made to reverse everything off that bill. And at 12.03, there was a lobbyist standing underneath our, our counting board 
and we actually have a little timestamp on the counting board. He was standing up, looking, just pointing at the number, saying it's 1203. You can't do anything. So wound up, we wound up having to recess because of the uh, inability of the Senate DFL to fulfill the promises that they make. Okay. It's it's so uh, fascinating to hear Senator Osmick um, recount, obviously having been there and really engaged in the process. Um, we had. The House had um, gone sine die, and I think we sent the bill over with a good 15 minutes left for them to easily, for the Senate to easily transact the business and the agreement that had been made. So there was no concern about that. So I did something for the first time that I have never done before. I had my computer on my desk, and we were done with our work. The bill was on its way, and so I tuned in to what was happening in the Senate, and so I witnessed. Uh, when I uh, logged in, uh, Senator Stumpf, I believe it was, who was had risen and was speaking about uh, something, probably burning well, he's time. He's the chief yeah. author of the bonding bill. Okay, okay. so he was right. presenting. Very, so very good. Was, was very good. This? So that's I I I uh, tuned in, and there he was. And before long, it was just moments. Um, here came Senator Bonhoff behind, and she was clearly orchestrating this. This amendment, hmm. this amendment to derail two years worth of work, and, and that's um, the sad part. And I was part. so, I was, I was amazed and so distraught um, to to witness this, and then what ensued. Um, yes, we then, you know, we then adjourned. So in the Senate, I don't know if, if they were aware at that point that we had done that, but to you know, here we have this great, yeah. as Representative Herta says said bipartisan, broadly bipartisan yeah. bill, agreements in the Senate. So this is just a matter of getting our work done on the deadline. We did our work and we did it well. Uh, fortunately, so many of our constituents and Minnesotans know and are so appreciative of the great work that we did and are equally as disappointed. So it's sad, we didn't get that done. We didn't get a bonding bill done and a few other things. And now the talk is special session. It's been talked about many times. And so we're gonna take a break when we come back, we're going to talk to you about the special session, if it's going to happen, what it's going to take to have happen, and what it looks like after that. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back to Capital Update. When we left you, we were talking about the special session or the, the normal session and all the things that went on in the final minutes and how a lot of business was left unchecked. And uh, now we are here the day after the session was finalized and a Representative Doubt came out and offered the governor an opportunity to go to special session. And um, what, I'm going to change this just a little bit, then Jerry, I'm going to turn it to you. I think it's interesting, interesting now is that we are in a position of compromising, and that's all we're going to hear about, how much are we willing to compromise. But what I find interesting is that where we were the day, last day of session and where we are now is completely different. And Jerry, I'm going to turn it to you. And, you know, when we left session, we had a $993 million bonding bill that needed or that was almost passed. We had a tax bill that was actually passed by the House and the Senate, mm -hmm. and we had pension relief bill that was passed by the House and the Senate. What happened? Well, thank you, Randy. Um, well, as you mentioned, Speaker Dowd did uh, contact the governor the following morning and recommended that uh, he consider calling a special session so that we could uh, pick up and finish uh, the, uh, the vote that didn't happen on the bonding bill and uh, certainly the, the tax bill, uh, which he at that time said he wouldn't hold hostage to any of the other negotiations. So. At that t time, the day after, it sounded like he had promised that he was going to sign the tax bill. Um, but interestingly, uh, when he thought about it a little bit in terms of what it was going to take to uh, call a special session, he issued a letter to the speaker the following day and listed 16 additional requirements or demands, if you will, that totaled just shy of $300 million. And then the 17th demand was that there had to be language for Southwest Light Rail, which was the very thing that caused the bonding bill to fail. When you add that in, that's another $130 million. So there were $430 million of additional demands by the governor in order to call a special session. It's important to remember that only the governor can call a special session and only the legislature can end it. So what that means 
is that the leadership has to come together and they have to agree in a very limited way what the scope of the special session will be before the governor will agree to call it. And unfortunately, with all of these additional demands, that made it very difficult uh, to get agreement in both the Senate and the, and the House in terms of uh, membership to uh, go ahead and, and call a session. And it's dragged on since that time. And the most recent thing we heard just uh, as recent as this last week is that maybe now after, uh, after the primaries are conducted, the governor is traveling to Croatia or something so that it might end up being that uh, there could be a special session after that. But um, clearly with all this extra spending, it's a budget buster in terms of trying to get the tax bill or any of these other things done. So $400 million worth of additional spending, so a 40% increase of where we left it on the last day of session. And I'm assuming that seeing that that 900 plus million was split about one third from cash on hand and 600 million for bonding, that this was going to be all additional bonding. So now it's going to be a billion dollars in additional bonding and 300 plus million of using that excess cash. That's correct. And we had uh, the previous session uh, almost 200 million of uh, provisional mm -hmm. bonding bill that was passed. So if you add that into the biennium, that gets you up to you know 1.4, 1.5 billion dollars, which uh, which would be precedent setting. Um, staggering. Yeah, staggering amount of money. Mm -hmm. So Cindy, you know the governor had bills in front of him. Mm -hmm. You had the pension reform, the tax bill, and well the bonding bill never made it to him. So we had two things. That's in, correct. And he vetoed one, and he pocket vetoed one. Why don't he, you talk about he that? He did. Um, so. The governor um, pocket vetoed, or actually I'll start with uh, what he vetoed, the pension reform bill. Um, this was a bill that also had broad bipartisan support. We have a significant uh, challenge before us with um, our pension liabilities, um, the state of Minnesota, and um, so we had a bill that would have just changed the trajectory and made this so much easier going forward to address the problem that, that we have. Um, and the governor vetoed it outright. So that was a tremendous disappointment. And the next legislature will most definitely have a greater task before them Absolutely. Uh, because of this. Um, the tax bill, the governor pocket vetoed. And as Representative Hurtas mentioned, that was so disappointing. We were so there. So tell, tell the listeners first, yes. what does it mean to pocket veto? And so a pocket veto means that the bill is on the governor's desk and it's waiting for him to sign. And if he doesn't sign it within a certain number of statutory days, um, then it is called a pocket veto, meaning um, he did not put his pen to the, to the bill and put his signature on it. So it, in essence, is vetoed. Um, so it's so referred to as a pocket veto. It nor personally vetoed yes. it. It just dies yes. on his desk. And, and right. the, the incredibly disappointing thing about this was that this bill, again, broadly bipartisan, it offered about $800 million worth of tax relief to countless Minnesotans, to seniors, to veterans, more tax relief to veterans, to students, to farmers, and other categories. And um, the fact that he pocket vetoed this unnecessarily, this could have been resolved, as Representative Hurtas mentioned, with a letter of intent allowing the commissioners to uphold the law um, based on what the legislative intent was. We could, when we're back in session, the House and Senate could easily, within the first transaction, um, address this. Right, and that's right for the, the viewers. I mean, this came down to semantics of uh, it did. or it versus a conjunctive word of and, and and or. And, and, and he, he yes, and opted not to do what other governors before him have and sign yes. it and put this well, there's letter what other, of intent. What other committee, uh, ch committee chairmen have done, uh, draft a letter, um, and what other governors have accepted. And the governor specifically told us, he told Minnesotans, he made a commitment to Minnesotans that he would not hold this tax bill hostage, and that's exactly what he in fact did. So I'm so disappointed that the governor was not a man of his word on this important tax yeah, relief bill for Minnesotans. Amazing. So we sit here, Senator, and we, we end session, you end session watching some theatrics happening in, in the Senate chambers. Um, the day after, Representative Doubt comes with an offer to try mm -hmm. to wrap up unfinished business, and in the days to follow, the governor has put forth 
a bonding bill that's 40% greater than what was there and probably will have other criteria had, had vetoed and pocket vetoed bills. Mm -hmm. and, and I started this, this uh, portion of the show on saying, you know, it's all about compromise and we're going to hear how we're not compromising, we're not getting our work done. Are we going to get a special session? Is there going to be compromise necessary to get us there? And, and if so, how do we get there? I'm not so sure. I mean, I'm torn. Um, I know that we had a great bonding bill, and I have not in three the first three years I have not voted for bonding bills. This one, I w I'm on record saying I, even though it's got some stinkers in it and some things that I don't necessarily like, I'm in favor of the bill, particularly because of the Highway 12 safety money that's in there. One of the arguments that the Sen the DFL senators have been making is, well, you know, our bonding capacity is two or three or four billion dollars. They, they keep changing the number on that. They're saying, well, we have time now. Right now is a good time for us to float the money and bond, bond, bond like crazy. And my answer is, it's not always a good thing to max out your credit card. It's not always a good thing to go to the top of your bonding limits and increase that amount of debt because sooner or later, good times are not going to be here in Minnesota. We're going to hit a recession and then we're really going to be in trouble. So am I optimistic? I, I'm really on the border right now. I really would like to get through uh, the Highway 12 safety money, but in the same respect, I don't think that we can possibly keep bringing the charges up on the credit card of Minnesotans because we can't eventually can't afford it. Sure. Yes or no? Uh, I'm okay. not. I'm not optimistic that there will be agreement. I think that the hundreds of millions of dollars that the governor is demanding, not to mention um, Southwest fund, the funding mechanism for Southwest Light Rail. Um, I, so I'm not optimistic. All right. Representative Hurtos? Well, and I would uh, segue on what uh, uh, Senator Osmick said, uh, running up the credit card. We're currently in our uh, uh, general fund budget are spending $1.2 billion per biennium servicing the debt on borrowed mm -hmm. money, right. which means if we didn't borrow that money or hadn't borrowed that money, we could be paying cash mm -hmm. for the amount of money we're spending to service the debt on it. With regard to whether or not we'll have a special session, I think uh, the governor has tipped his hand a little bit and suggested that we ought to. I think he's put his own party and his memberships in a very precarious situation in that this broad bipartisan bill, the tax bill 123 to 10 or so, the bonding bill 9139, uh, basically, these are measures that uh, there was uh, overwhelming support, uh, and that is the spirit of compromise that we pass mm -hmm. these things through. And uh, it's really up to him. And uh, I think uh, going to the polls this uh, fall will be difficult for Democrats to uh, rationalize uh, why their leader uh, stood in the way of getting some of this stuff done. Okay. Well, that's all we have today. So. Senator Osmick, Representative Pugh, Representative Hurtas, thanks for joining us today and, and thanks, bringing Randy. a lot of information. And viewers, thank you for joining us. Remember, each one of these members would love to hear from you. If you have some questions from today's show, email them, contact them, and they'll give you more detail. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Capital Update.